with a number of core operators. Okay? And each core operator is then uh, passed to a module called query evaluator. And the query evaluator will look at the particular operator and find a particular way of executing that operator. So before we talk about query optimization, uh, let's first talk about query evaluation, meaning that given a particular query operator, how do you execute that particular operator? So a single operator, okay? How do you execute that? And once we understand this, we will then talk about, you know, given a SQL query, which is essentially a combination of multiple query operators, how do you optimize uh, this set of operators and find the best sequence of executing those operators. Okay. So that's kind of uh, the roadmap. So let's look at what are some, some of the possible inputs right, for uh, crop finder and query evaluations. Generally speaking, we have two types of queries we need to deal with, two types of queries. One is what we call single table queries, meaning those SQL queries that requires access to only a single table of data. An example, example is given here. This is as complex as you can go for a single table query, right? Involve, you know, duplicate elimination because you have the keyword distinct, involve group by, having an order by. This is as complex as you can go as far as a single table query is concerned, okay? So, I highlighted those you know, uh, uh, operators uh, and to give you a quick recap what they mean. Right? Of course, the most basic one is without any of this. The most basic single table query is select from a single table with a wire clause. Now, that's the most basic uh, version of single table query. But it can be as complica complicated as having all of this. Okay. So here is an example of this. So, for example, I can do select this thing, student name and GPA from student where department equal to CS. And I can keep adding, <coughs> I'm going to skip all of this because this is just a recap of what we have, right? What we talked about. And this is you know, as complex as you can go for a single table single query, right? Here I'm doing a group by with having an order by uh, and also with aggregation at the output. So let's look at a basic single table query. Right? We talked about before, uh, this will be converted to a query plan tree. And in this particular case, uh, we will produce a query plan tree like that. If you look at this, what it says is I'm going to do a heap file scan over, of course, the base input is a student table. So I'm, I'm going to do a heap file scan over that and put that out these two attributes, name and GP. Then I can I will you know take these two attributes and you know, submit them to a sort operator. Of course, by now you know this sort operator will be that external merge sort. If data is large enough, that cannot fit in main memory. Otherwise, you use the internal memory uh, internal memory sorting algorithm to do that. Okay. And then finally, you apply the distinct keyword, uh, which is to remove duplicates. I will talk about this before I thought. Once you sort your data, you can easily remove duplicates, right? By just uh, maintaining, uh, uh, by maintaining a running, var running variable uh, that stores the current value, and whenever the next value is different from the current value, uh, you know that's a new distinct value, but if the next value is the same, you just keep skipping that. Okay? That's how you uh, eliminate uh, duplicates by sorting. I think we, yeah, go ahead. Are there any tricks though, I guess, with distinct like aliases too, because I imagine, I mean that works if most of your values are not distinct, but like if you have only three values and it's like a hundred uh, million records, then that would be really, really bad performance. Okay. Yeah, so let me repeat the question. The question is, <coughs> consider an extreme case where you have one million values, but there are only three distinct values. Using sorting to remove duplicates works, but it seems like a overkill, right? Because you only have three distinct values, and in order to get those three distinct values, you have to sort uh, entire one million values, right? Mm -hmm. 
So the answer to your question is, there's really not much we can do, uh, fundamentally because of this. Imagine you know you have you know one value short of a medium value you have to cut. Right? If you don't look at the last value, you have no way of knowing for sure whether the last value is a duplicate or a new distinct value. In other words, a, you know a bottom line in terms of the cost of doing this is to look at all the value at least once. It's linear cost, at least. Can you do better than linear cost? Uh, if you do sorting, uh, obviously it's more expensive than linear cost, right? Because, uh, in internal memory, it's at least a lot. So the answer is, in some cases, you can use hashing to remove duplicates. In fact, that's something I'm going to discuss uh, in the next few slides. Uh, using hashing, you can actually remove duplicates in most cases much more efficiently than sorting. Unless you end up with a really bad hash function. Uh, that doesn't give you a balanced distribution of, of, of values into different hash functions. Okay. So this again is a recap to what we said before. I believe we talked about this before. The volcano model, right? Where we introduced the iterator interface. Uh, in database engines, they use this particular interface called iterator interface to implement different operators. They involve you know, this particular setup, which is there's a method called uh, initialization, then there's a method called next, then there's another method called close, then there's an iterator uh, uh, variable, member variable as input, which is an array uh, of references. A reference is just like pointers, right? Just like providing a pointer to another each reader object. And I have an array of this. In most cases, the, the size of this array is, uh, is one. Meaning, you know, for example, the input to this operator is simply this operator down below. So the size of that array is just one. But in some cases, if the join operator then the size of this array will be 2 if it's a join operator because you're going to have two children iterator interfaces representing two operators you know, uh, as your children know in that query mantra, in that query mantra. Okay? Here is a specific example of using this iterator, iterator interface to, implementing, to implement sorting so, if you remember the sort algorithm we talked about, the external merge sort algorithm we talked about, what do we really need? Well, we need some internal uh, member state variables, such as number of rounds. So, at any particular phase, I need to know how many rounds I have. And I, I also need to have pointers to the beginning address of each round. Right? Remember the maximum more sort. Right? Uh, each of this is a single rock. Each of this is a single rock. Right? Let's imagine we're in the middle of the merging process. We we'll have multiple runs. Right? Each of this is a single rock. And each run, of course, is multiple pages. Uh, they are all sorted. Within the run, they are sorted. So what this set of code here, use my mouse here. It says is I, I need to have an array of rounds. Uh, of course, this is called disk block. Uh, this is just you know a, a name that I use for this example, right? It represents, uh, for example, a single disk block. The beginning address of this block, right? This can be anything else, right? That that you you want to name this as a this page address or whatever, right? In your code, that's fine, right? So imagine in my code, there is an object called there's a class called this block that represents the address of a particular this block. Okay, and I'm just having an array of this so that I remember. Uh, for example, the first page of each one, the first page of each one. So why I need an array of this? Because I need this to be my input 
in order to do the merging phase, in order to merge them. Right? I also need, of course, the number of rounds. I also need the uh, RID, which is once you bring them to the min memory, remember what we do in the min memory is that we have a single page. And we need to remember the next record ID to be merged. Right? So that's the purpose of this next RD array that is for, right? The size of both arrays, the size of both arrays is simply a uh, number of rounds. Simply a number of rounds. Does that make sense? And with this, you know, facilitating member variables, you can then implement uh, this uh, uh, this method. For example, in the initialization method, what you do is in the initialization phase, uh, you don't have any rounds, right? You don't have any rounds. You only have n pages of unsorted data. So one option for that initialization phase is to uh, load those pages in the memory and sort them, and you get n over b box. Sorry, uh, not n over b. You have n over b pages, and you but your memory set is m over b, right? So you got this many rounds, and each is m over b pages. Suppose you don't use the optimized uh, sorting algorithm, the tournament sort. You just use the basic uh, in-memory sorting algorithm. You load m over b pages, sort them. So next app over B page you sort them. So you end up with this many rounds. So essentially the over F rounds, the, the B factor cancel off. And each is this many rounds. So that could be what you do in the initialization phase. In the initialization method. Does that make sense? And then the next method, you can imagine this is one merging phase. Or this can be as simple as moving the cursor by one position, it depending on how you want to implement this. Okay? It could be as simple as moving the RID by one, this RID pointer by one, or it can be just an entire merging phase, then you return, you know, after the merging phase, the first record after the merging phase. It depending on how you want to implement uh, uh, this particular method. So, so that gives you an example of how to use that iterator interface. And in your last three, you are required to implement a few operators using, a, using an interface similar to this. Not identical to this, but really similar to this. Okay. To give you another example, okay, let's say I want to do sort and group by. So really what I'm trying to do is this. Imagine I have a query like this. And I need to uh, group by a particular attribute. And after the group by operation, I need to uh, produce an aggregation for each group. I need to produce an aggregation for each group. So in this case, I'm, I'm grouping the student based on the department. I'm trying to find the average GPA of students from a particular department, as well as the number of students from that department. How do I implement this? Okay? The most Naive implementation is to use sorting again. Right? The idea is you sort the uh, uh, incoming attributes, incoming tuples, based on the grouping attribute. What do you get by doing that? Well, what you get by doing that is all the records that are supposed to go into the same group after the sorting will end up in consecutive segments. Because you sort them by the uh, grouping attributes. That makes sense. And once you have done that, you do another pass over the sorted output and carry out your aggregation. For all those records with the same values, they're going to end up in consecutive segments, so you just continue scanning them while maintaining uh, the aggregation values. And whenever you encounter a new value, you know that's a new group that indicates the start of a new group. You reset your aggregate value and recalculate a new aggregation value for the new group. Okay, so that's essentially uh, the 
the first method of implementing group by an aggregation. You can do slightly better. Uh, you can do uh, you can do the aggregation while you do the grouping. The idea is, you know, as soon as you have sorted the output, and you imagine you are doing this merge sort process, right? For those values that are next to each other, you know they must be in the same group. So you can do this in a streaming fashion, meaning that you can maintain, for example, for count, you can maintain a count so far. And if all the values that are the same, coming out of from the merging phase, you maintain a running variable to represent the count. Whenever the next tuple come to the aggregation operator, you increase the count level. Because, because you know, it works because the aggregation operator comes after the sorting operator. So when the aggregation operator calls this method next from your sorting operator, so the way it works is this aggregation operator will keep calling the, sort, uh, the next operator from the sort operator. And I'm going to view the sort operator as a black box. I don't really care what you do inside a sort operator, but what I know for sure is the next operator, the next interface from the sort operator must return records in sorting order. How you do it, that's your job. I don't really care. I view you as a black box. I just keep calling the next operator to fetch the next tuple out of the sort operator. Um, by being the sort operator, I know that you have the responsibility to guarantee that your output is sorted. So I just keep calling the next operator, and I know for a fact that tuples coming out of the sort operator must be sorted. Does that make sense? And that means that I can maintain the aggregation in a streaming fashion because they are coming out of the sort of sort operator in sorting order. So I simply maintain an aggregation uh, uh, in a streaming fashion for the current group. In other words, all records within one group must be coming out of that sort operator in consecutive sequences. So whenever I see a new value, I know that must be the start of a new group. That makes sense? Guarantee by the sort operator. Okay, so that's the first way of doing uh, group by and aggregation. Another way of doing this is by hashing. This is somewhat related to uh, Billy's earlier question on duplicate elimination. Okay, uh, instead of using sorting, I can also use hashing. The idea is, given all the input, I will design a hash function. Of course, design a good hash function as we discussed. And we will distribute the input to different buckets. The observation is as follows. If you have the same value with respect to the grouping attribute, then you are guaranteed to end up in the same bucket. Okay? In other words, hash of x <coughs> is always equal to hash of x. Right? So all the tuples with the same values with respect to the grouping attribute, if you use your hash function over the grouping attribute, they are guaranteed to end up in the same bucket. That make sense? Unfortunately, there is another observation, which is it's possible It's also possible that right? it's also possible that you may have clearance. If we don't have clearance, fantastic. You know, if we don't have clearance, suppose you are doing group by and count. If you don't have clearance, and all of the tuples with the same grouping values are end up in the same end up in the same grouping bucket you can return the answer immediately after hashing, right? So you simply look at the size of each bucket, that's the answer for the group by count. Unfortunately, you have clearance, meaning that you cannot re uh, return immediately 
after the hashing operation. Because students from the math department may end up in the same bucket with the CS students. So the bucket with the CS students, suppose the size of that is 100, you cannot return 100 as the answer for the number of CS students, because you may have math student in our bucket as well. But a really important observation is as well, which is if you do have math students end up in the same uh, bucket with CS students, what do you know? Well, all the students from the math department will be in that market. Not just one, not just two, but all of them. <coughs> Even if you just see one student from the math department, then all of them must be in that market as well. That's guaranteed by, by this observation. Huh? So meaning that if X and Y has one clearance, they will have clearance always. Okay, so that's the operation. So this gives us the idea to design our algorithm, which is we're going to use hashing to distribute these values into different buckets. Once we are in a given bucket, we just need to somehow distinguish the, the different values, x and y, that do have clearance with respect to this bucket. As soon as we are able to do that, we can return the answer for Google aggregation, for any sort of aggregation. Right? So that's kind of the idea. So in particular, we're going to design this two-phase hashing algorithm to do this. So the first phase is what we call partition. The idea is as follows. So on the left, the top left, uh, the top graph and to the left of that, what we have is a set of pages that represent your input data, right? the student table, suppose. And we apply a hash function, and we use an input buffer to do that. Meaning that we load a page at a time, we do buffer read, we never read just a single record, we always read a page of data. So we load a page of data into that input buffer, and then we apply a hash function h over every record from that input buffer. Of course, the hash is the hashing is done with respect to whatever hashing attribute of your choice. Suppose that's like our grouping, uh, group by attribute, let's say department, a hash by department. Okay? And that will push this record to one of the output uh, buffers. And suppose I have m over b minus one output buffers, because my total memory size is m over b. One is reserved for the input buffer, so I must have m over b minus one number of output buffers meaning that the number of hash buckets I have is n over b minus 1. So far so good. And how I design that hash function, that's easy. I can design my hash function to be n over b minus 1 over hash buckets. Okay? So this guarantee pairwise independence, as we discussed. And in addition to that, I will mod, uh, actually I just mod this, uh, yes. Uh, that will distribute distribute an incoming record to one of the m over b minus one buckets. That makes sense. Yes. Any questions so far? Now, whenever the output buffer is filled, meaning the entire page is occupied, what I do? I dump that entire page to disk to a particular area of disk. So as this goes by, as I read more and more pages from the input buffer and do more and more hashing, these pages, these corresponding pages will slowly build up. Okay? And I remember where each output buffer page goes. And make sure that if you are coming out of the same output buffer, meaning all of you are coming out from one, I will remember them in the same group as partition 1. Similarly, for all the output buffer pages coming out of output buffer 2, I will you know, mark them as partition number 2, so on and so forth, until I get partition m over b minus 1. So I have m over b minus 1 number of partitions on, the, on this side, on the output side. OK? So far, so good. So what do I get out of this? What I get is 
a number of partitions such that all the values, all the record with the same values with respect to the grouping attribute will end up in the same partition. Of course, I may have cleared it, right? In other words, for example, all the CS department may end up in partition 2. All of them. And they also have some, not some, but all of the math department end up in partition 2 as well. Because suppose I have cleared that hash of CS equal to hash of math. Right? Suppose I have this clear. So that's what will happen. Right? And suppose this uh, equal to 2, then all of them will end up in partition 2. Does that make sense? But what, but what I also know for sure is that any CS department student and any math department student must be in partition 2. They cannot be in any other partition. That's impossible. All of them must be in partition 2. That make sense? Okay. So the only remaining job for us is to distinguish, as I mentioned before, from partition 2, who are the CS students who are the math student. Once I'm able to do that, I can carry out my aggregation with respect to rule by my department. Okay? So in order to do that, I will introduce a rehash phase, which is to take the, the partition output, so this is a duplicate of that, and load them to the main memory and apply yet another hash function to distinguish CS and math students. The way I'm going to do this is I'm going to do this partition by partition. The reason is that I never really need to look across partitions anymore. Because in order for me to find all the CS students, I only really need to look at partition 2. I don't need to look at any other partition. Henceforth, for my second phase, I do so partition by partition. In other words, I load the first partition into my memory hash them, and then I load my second partition into memory hash them, so on so forth. Okay? And I, I have to use another hash function called rehash function, meaning I don't want to use the same hash function. Why? Because if you use the same hash function, it serves no purposes. CS still going to uh, uh, have a clear with math. It doesn't really help you to distinguish CS and math students. So you want to use another hash function. My, another, so suppose this is my partition hash function HP. I'm going to use another hash function called rehash hash function HR, where this is probably something like this. Does that make sense? I use a different hash function. So now, of course, for the first hash function, I have this clear uh, uh, observation, right? CS and math uh, have a clear. But, but what's the probability that they will have clear again? That's fairly low, right? But you are using two independent hash functions. And they are all pairwise independent hash functions. So what's the clear probability for universal hash? You guys remember. Yeah. And one more M, right? Suppose, <coughs> my, of course, my output is m over b minus 1, right? Mm -hmm. So my, let me use a number to represent this. Let me uh, see if this is equal to z. m over b minus 1 is z. So my output size is z. So my clear probability for this is already 1. It's 1 over z squared, right? Because they are pairwise independent, cs is mapped to 1 of z output is 1 over z. And then for the mass value to be hashed to the same bracket, the probability is also 1 over z. You multiply that because they are pairwise independent, so the clear probability is 1 over z squared. One hash function, that make sense? The clear probability for c as a mass for the second hash function is also 1 over z squared. That makes sense, right? So for that to have clear 
with respect to both the first hash function and second hash function is what? It's a multiplication of the two. So the, at the end of the day, the, the clear probability becomes 1 over z to the power of 4. Does that make sense? In order for CS and math to, to be end up in the same bucket after the second hash function. That's fairly low, right? Z is typically the, is the number of pages in your memory, right? You have what? Thousands or millions of pages, right? In your memory, right? In my, in my computer, 16 gigabytes. And each, suppose each page is 4 kilobytes. Let's say I just use 1 gigabyte for my, uh, for my memory. So for the ease of calculation, suppose my page size is 1 kilobyte. So I have 1,000 pages in my memory. Right? Actually, no, a uh, million, right? So that is just one megabyte. I have a million pages <coughs> in my memory for one gigabyte of RAM, one kilobyte page. So that leads to a million pages. So my Z is roughly 10 to the power of 6. So my clearing probability after you know, two level of hashing is almost zero. It's not zero for sure, but it's like, it's fairly small. So, I was wondering with that, do database systems though, do they usually allow like, because I guess this is like good if it's just, if you're just running like one query at a time, but do they typically allow like an individual query to use like all of the memory available, or do they no, use they, some sort of schedule typically and they, stuff? That's a good question. Typically, we, as a database <coughs> administrator, when you initially set up a database server, you need to specify how much memory uh, you are using. Uh, you reserve that, that much uh, memory space from your operating system. Well, does it do that though? Because like per query, like maybe you're executing like I see what you're okay. Yeah, uh, what you are saying is, you know, does database server adjust this memory size dynamically over time? Uh, that's actually an active research question right now. Right? People are using machine learning techniques to figure out what's the optimal uh, memory allocation strategy for an uh, operating system, right? For data system. Mm -hmm. Do you really need to reserve that much memory? If you're using really small, tiny uh, amount of space, you don't really need to reserve that much memory for your query. But occasionally, we have a big query workflow coming into your system, you want to reserve a lot of memory. Can you adjust it dynamically over time, right? So most database systems at the moment doesn't do that. They, they, at the initial setup, they have a, a configuration file. You know, for example, I can show you really quick. So this is a typical MySQL configuration file, and there should be a place where it says memory uh, size. So this is for example where they set the buffer size. Okay. Right? That make sense? Okay. And you can change these values in your configuration file. Uh, to change how much memory you are you are reserving from uh, from the operating system, and so they usually just give like each query has like some fixed amount of memory it can use. So actually, my my SQL configuration file has you know it comes with some default sample configuration file for big and small and for large. So when you, you know, install MySQL Server, it distributes a couple of sample configuration files for you. One is for what they call small, one for medium, one for large. And if you look at the difference of those three configuration files, they differ in, for example, the memory size with, with the reserve. Mm -hmm. For small, they assume you are setting up this on a small machine uh, such that the memory size of reserve is fairly small. And this is an example for large. So you can, you can, I don't want to go into detail, but, but you can kind of just Google yourself and find out the difference of 
those default sample farms. But the point is, once you reserve those memory uh, space for your David server, it's reserved. It doesn't change over time. It does not change over time. Okay. Now let's come back to here. I, I realized I made a mistake in this calculation. I need to fix this. So the clear probability with regard to one bucket is one over z squared. But you have z bucket, you may have clears. So it's this. So the clear probability for one hash function is one over z. So the clear for two hash function is one over z squared instead of one over z to the power four. Then we test the clear, you know, acts into a particular bucket, first bucket. The probability of this is one over z. For y to end up in the same bucket is one over z. Is this right? But I can do this for z buckets in total, right? So the clear probability after one hash function is 1 over z instead of 1 over z squared. So I made a mistake over there, so I think that. But with two level hashing, it's reduced to 1 over z squared. Suppose z is 10 to the power 6, which means my clear probability after one level hashing is only this much. And my clear probability after two level hashing is this. And this is not 0, but it's like if you end up with a clear after two level hashing, you should consider buying all three that day. Right? I mean, it's a fairly small probability. Fairly small probability. Okay, so that being said, now here is a complete algorithm, right? So imagine one row on this table here. A single row represents one market of that second hash function. So each row is a market. Each row is a market. What that tells you is all the CS students will end up in one row. All the math students will end up in another row with high probability. The chance of you having CS and math students in the same row as the output of that second hash function is nearly zero. That make sense? Follow our calculation here. Now, if you ask to do group by count, you know, looking at the earlier uh, query example, you, you, you were asked to produce a oh, number of students per department. At this point, you can simply return the number of records per row as the answer to that group by word. That make sense? Okay, so that's essentially this algorithm. <coughs> there is only one catch. The catch is that you, you do this rehash phase per partition, right? For each partition, you uh, bring them to memory and you rehash them. Hash them to different rows. In other words, hash them to different markets. In order for this to work, there is a constraint. The constraint is that the entire partition must be able to fit into your memory. Right? If your partition is bigger than the memory size, this doesn't work because you are not able to look at all records from the same partition if that's the case. Does that make sense? So to formally define that constraint, the constraint is as follows. The constraint is that size of one partition or any partition. The set of this must that's equal to your memory size. Your memory size is what? M over B. Huh? M over B. Set of any partition must less than or equal to M over B in order for the rehash phase to be carried out without any problem. Right? And what's, what is the value of this? Well, you don't know for sure because the set of one partition uh, varies from another partition. Depending on how the hash function in the first level distributes records into different partitions. But suppose we're using a good enough hash function. A good enough hash function should have the following property, which is I distribute all the records roughly in a uniform fashion to different partitions. That's the fundamental requirement for a good hash function, right? 
you do an even distribution of incoming records into different partitions. You don't have a skewed distribution, meaning the worst case scenario is all records end up in the same partition. That's like you have done no hashing at all, if that happens. So suppose you are, you are using a good enough hash function, you are doing a uniform distribution of records into different partitions, what is the size of one partition? Well, that's simply the total number of pages you have, which is n over b, divided by number of partitions you have, which is m over b minus 1, in our case. So the size of any partition is roughly this. And this must less equal than m over b. So that's essentially our construct. Do you follow this calculation? Yes or no? Right, this is assuming you are using a good hash function, meaning that it does an even distribution of record into different partitions. This is the number of partitions you have, this is the total number of pages you have. So the size of one partition is simply like this. And to simplify my expression, I can. So it's roughly this. Take out the minus one. So this translates to n over b must less equal, less equal to n over b squared. Okay? In order for this algorithm to work. In order for this algorithm to work. So far so good? What happens if it, if it doesn't satisfy this constraint? In most cases, this is true. In most cases, this is true, right? Because, yes, n is typically much bigger than n. Okay? But what you're looking at is m, you know, if you look at this two term, you can uh, get rid of this b factor. So you add up with this m squared over b. So what you're saying is yes, n is much greater than m, but m squared over b, uh, you need this to be greater than n. Uh, m squared is a huge number, anything squared is a big number. Even if you scale by a factor b, the chance you know, for m squared over b to be greater than n is still fairly, it's, you, have, you have fairly good opportunity for this to be true. But what if it doesn't? If it doesn't, what happens is one or more partitions from the output of the first phase will not be able to fit in, in your main memory. I say that because your hash function may not be a perfect distribution, may not be a perfect distribution. So some partition will end up in, in practice, some partition may be slightly larger than some other partitions. So while most of your partitions are able to fit in memory, you have a small number of partitions that, that happen to be large and doesn't fit in your memory. Does that make sense? What do you do when that happens? Meaning when size of a partition What happens if this happens? What do you do when this happens? Well, when this happens, you take this partition and you apply this algorithm recursively. You view this partition as your input. You introduce yet another level of partition, then we hash. Meaning you don't use one partition, you use two partition hash functions for this partition. And uh, you do this recursively. That makes sense? You simply view this partition as your input data. And the one on the left, on the top, figure. Apply another level of partition hash function before you do the rehash. With high probability, this will you know, break up this partition, large partition, into a set of smaller partitions where each smaller partition fit in your memory. Then you're good to go. Can't you, also you first, then yeah. Oh, you're yeah, first. Yeah. Oh, okay. Seems like they could still kind of get into trouble with this algorithm if, like, your keys are not evenly distributed. Like, if you have like, a bunch of one particular key and then hardly. Yep. That's totally right. In the in the extreme case, 
to uh, build up your argument. Imagine my input data are all different. So no matter how you design your hash function, no matter how good your hash function is, they always end up in the same partition. That makes sense? At that point, if that happens, what you do is in your algorithm, you will detect that. And if that happens, you know, you know, this is after two levels, suppose after two levels of hashing, all records always stay in the same partition. With our analysis, you know that you know the chance that you have different values giving you this is very small. It must be most likely they are all duplicates. Right? So at that point, you can simply return the size of that partition as you answer. You don't even need to do the rehash phase. Right? Okay. Do you follow my response? Mm -hmm. okay. What about you? The similar? OK. So this is the analysis. I'm going to skip this. OK? The analysis, I, I just skip this. OK? So. So this is a more, a more detailed description of, of what we said. I'm going to skip this. So all we did is replace that stored operator with a hash operator. Then we can uh, do the hash and aggregation. You can even do better, which is to combine the aggregation and hash operator into one operator called hash aggregation operator. The idea is as follows. Instead of doing a two-phase approach, as we uh, did before, what we're gonna do is as follows. You know, we are gonna reduce the number of partitions uh, produced by my partition hash function. Specifically, I'm gonna reduce that by k uh, by a value of k. Meaning that instead of producing m over b minus one partitions, I produce only m over b minus k partitions. So that gives me another k pages in my memory to use. That make sense? What I do with those k pages? That's a key question. What I do with these k pages? The observation as the follows. If your final objective is to do aggregation, you can actually do the aggregation on the fly, as I mentioned before, in a streaming fashion. Right? For example, if your goal is to count the number of CS students, you don't really need to keep track of all the CS students. All you need to do is maintain a single counter representing the number of CS students, and whenever you see a new CS student, you increment the counter by one. After you have done that, you can ignore that CS student. You can throw away that CS student record. You don't have to keep that record of, uh, around for the remaining part of your calculation. That saves a lot of space for you. And overhead. So that's the kind of the operation we're trying to leverage on. So that being said, what I do is as follows. I'm going to reserve k pages to build an in-memory hash table. In other words, I'm combining the second phase. So imagine this is my in-memory hash table produced by that rehash function from the second phase. I'm going to take this whole thing and merge that into the first phase. Merge that into the first phase. Okay? And how this works is as follows. For an incoming record out of this input buffer, so input buffer stays the same. I have one page of data here. And for any record, I will apply this particular hash function. I will write down the hash function here, which is on the slide as well. But I'm going to discuss the detail of this hash function here on the web. OK, this hash function works as follows. <coughs> I call this the uh, hybrid hash function. Hybrid hash function. So I call this hash function H. H, H stands for hybrid. And this hash function, of course, is applied to a hash value x. Suppose this is your, uh, the, the, the grouping attribute value from a particular record. CS or math or you know, civil engineering. Right. Example. Okay. My hash function will be equal to the following. 
my hash function will equal to hr of x. hr is my rehash re -hash, hash function, just like the rehash hash function in the earlier discussion. If, there's an if, okay? If one of the following is true. If x is already there in the size k in my hashtag, what's the reason for this? Well, if x is already there, pushing x to the in my hash table will not increase the size of that in my hash table because you are simply maintaining a counter, an aggregate value. You are not maintaining the specific record for each x value. You are only updating the counter values, the aggregation values. Does that make sense? So if x is already counted for in the size k memory, in memory hash table, pushing another record with value x to that in memory hash table will not increase the size of that memory table, will only update the corresponding counters <coughs> by one if it's a count, or the sum by some amount. But it will not increase the size of that memory table, uh, size k memory hash table. Or if if this is not true, means that must that must be x is not there yet. If x is not there yet, and there's still space left, I can still do this. I should push, I should push this record with value x to that new memory hash table. I simply create a new counter for x. For example, this is the first CS student I have ever encountered. I will create a counter called CS in that size k memory hash table and start counting the number of CS students I have because I still have space. If none of this is true, what do you do? Meaning that the size k hash table is entirely filled, is entirely filled up with different counters for CS, for math, for civil engineering, and all that. And you come, you come encounter, you encounter a new department, let's say history, and there's no space left over there, what do you do? At this point, you have no choice but start producing partition on disk to cater for these new values and later rehash them. So if that's the case, I will apply the hash function h. Which will give you the up which uh, push them to these guys. Any question regarding this process? Are we assuming that the in-memory hash table uh, takes care of collisions like normal hash uh, The clear probability for that in-memory hash table is very small. Okay. As can imagine. As for, it's followed pretty much the same analysis as we did. Okay. okay. So in this picture, I kind of, this picture here illustrates this by saying, okay, you can imagine this is case one, and this is case from two to f over b minus k. Right, because this produced output of, in the range of from bar k two to bar k f over b minus k. And you can, you can imagine this is, you know, bar k1, and within bar k1, I introduce another hash function, hr. That's another way of viewing this, right? Within bar k1, 
I introduce another hash function HR. For the other bucket, I simply <coughs> push them to the corresponding bucket using HP. That makes sense? And hopefully in most cases, in most cases, what do you have? In most cases, that all the records are pushed to, to this, this case. Either you have space or you have an existing counter or aggregate value for that corresponding x values. So you never need to worry about the partition phase at all. So this will end up saving you a lot of cost, of course. That makes sense? By the way, I forgot to do the I.O. analysis for this, uh, for this algorithm. What is the total I.O. cost for this algorithm? Suppose, suppose any partition will fit into memory in the second rehash phase. In other words, this constraint is true. M over B is less, I'm uh, sorry, M over B, M over B is less than M over B. Suppose this is true. Uh, what's the total I.O. cost for this algorithm? What's the cost for the uh, partition phase? That's what I'm talking about. What's the cost for the partition phase? each partition once, meaning we read the entire partition into the memory, build a memory hash table for that partition. Then we throw away that and do the next partition and so on and so forth. So by the end of the day, we read each partition once. And by the end of that, you have read the entire pages once. The summation of all the partitions is simply n over b. So the total cost it's simply what? 3 and over B. Of course, when this is true, you must have this. If you don't have this, some partitions you might have to read multiple times. Because you have to read partition them before you can do the rehash. Does that make sense? Okay? Now, what's, what is the IO cost of this algorithm? Well, if you're lucky enough, if you're lucky enough, meaning that all the records end up here, meaning either this is true or this is true. If that's the case, what's your IO cost? It's simply n over b. By the end of the day, you have read each record once. You have read each page once. It's simply n over b. If this is true. You follow me? If this is not the case, what is the I.O. cost? Well, it, in that case, it's impossible to give an exact number because you don't know how many of them end up here, how many of them end up here. But the point is, m most of them will end up here. A small fraction of them will end up here. For, for that small fraction of record end up here, you need to go through the partition phase and rehash phase. Suppose 90% of them goes here, and 10% goes here, what's the I.O. cost? Well, for 90% of that, you simply pay n over, you know, uh, one I.O. to read that. So it's 90% times n over b. For the remaining 
I owed is simply this. You read them in, you partition them back to this, and you read them back in again to do the rehash. So three times of that. So the total cost is simply this. We follow the analysis. Assuming 90% of them end up here, 10% end up here. I can, of course, change the ratio of the two, and that will slightly you know, change the formula here. But the point is, this is all, and comparing these two values, uh, this is always a better uh, approach than this. Good morning. Of course, one observation is this only works if, you, if your final objective is to do aggregation. Because the only trick we are doing is to use aggregation to reduce the space usage of maintaining those in memory hash tables. If your objective somehow is to partition, for example, I'm not trying to count the number of students, I'm not trying to do the average GPA, I just want to partition CS student and math student and history student and whatever. Then you have to keep track of each particular record. Then doing this will not save you space or idle cost because your in-memory hash table will be as big as you the number of records end up there. <coughs> it doesn't save you anything in that case. Better case. But since we are dealing with aggregation, hundreds or hundreds of CS students are reduced to a single value or two values if you are maintaining two aggregates per group. And that's why this trick works. You follow me? Any question on this? Okay, not one. So I'm gonna skip this core optimization overview, okay? All right, so next I'm gonna talk about some other operators. So we talk about Google and we talk about uh, this thing, sorting and hashing uh, to implement those operators, okay? Next we're gonna talk about some other operators, such as selection, projection, and in particular join operator, which is a big part of your lab okay? And set different set union and all that kind of right? Some others, okay? For our discussion, we're going to use our old friend, Sailor and Reserve. We haven't seen them for a while. Let's you know, reintroduce them. And we're going to have some specifics uh, for the setup of these tables. Okay. I'm going to come back to this from time to time, so you don't have to memorize, memorize uh, the values. So for simple selection, in most cases, we're dealing with what we call a venture. Right? So find the reserves records where name is you know less than or uh, equal to a particular value. Uh, here we introduce a terminology that's called a reduction factor, also known as the selectivity of your query. The reduction factor tells you is something like this, right? 90 percent, 10 percent, tells you how many records in percentage from your input table satisfy your query condition? For example, if I say, okay, uh, return all the CS students, and suppose CS student is 10% of the student population at the University of Utah, then the reduction factor or selectivity of that query is 10%. Okay? It simply tells you what's the percentage of records satisfying your query condition. That being said, reduction factor or selectivity is not a constant. It changes when you change your query condition. Right? It changes uh, when you change your query condition. For example, if you uh, say a student ten percent, then the selectivity for you know select from student where department equals CS is ten percent. But if I change my query to select from student where department equals math and math student is 5% of population, then the selectivity becomes 5% instead of 10%. So really the decision here, in terms of how you're going to execute this query, right? how do you execute this particular selection, <coughs> it depends on a lot of things. For, one, for example, it depends on whether you have an index or not. If you do not have an index, if you do not have an index, what do you do? 
Well, the only choice you have is heat file scan. You do a scan over your heat file for the student record. But there's, there's a slight variation over there depending on whether the file is sorted or not. If your file is sorted with regard to, for example, to the reserve table, right? For the heat file for the reserve table, suppose is sorted by uh, the reserve name, our name. Then you can do a, a better execution of this query by doing a binary search instead of doing a, a linear default scan. But even in that case, even in that case, it depends on your selectivity. It depends on your selectivity. Let me give you an extreme case example. Right? Suppose this is my reserve table. stored in a heat pump. So this is a reserve reserve heat pump. Okay? And it has multiple pages. Okay? Now further assume that they are sorted with regard to the uh, R name. So they're sorted with regard to And when you know this, and given this query, you say, okay, immediately you jump to the conclusion that I should use binary search to do this. What I do is, I find the first record start with the letter C. I find the first record with the name start with the letter C. Then I do a linear scan to the left of that. I will be able to find all such records. Then we get, suppose that Record locates like somewhere here. And for this record, my R name equals CAA. That's the smallest word you can think about starting with letter C. Okay? Suppose they are sorted alphabetically. So any other word starting with letter C will be guaranteed to be smaller than this because there are no letters smaller than A. Okay? You follow me? So you do a linear scan over here. But in order to find this record, what do you do? You have to do a binary search. The binary search cost is roughly log <coughs> 2 of O over B. And given this particular example, it's roughly in the middle of it. Right? So roughly I'm looking at another O over B IOs to do the linear scan of it. And this, of course, is better than If I carry out this search using a uh, heat file scan, if I do this in heat file scan, what I have to do? I have to basically scan through everything to be sure that I'm not missing any record. So the cost is think about the over B. Right? You follow me? So far, so good. However, if, my, if I change my data distribution a little bit. Suppose this record is not here anymore. Suppose this record is here. You have to use binary search to find this record. And what happened afterwards? You go backwards, you add up scanning the entire thing. Right? So your total cost is actually worse than if you just just do it without doing the binary search. Do you follow me? The point is, the point is, which method is better really depends on your selectivity. The selectivity in the second case is what? 100%. The selectivity in the first case is what? 50%. So selectivity plays an important role in how you carry out the particular query. So Dylan has a question. Let me guess what you're trying to say. Yeah. I think what Dylan is trying to say is, in the heat file scan case, instead of paying N over B cost, can I, well, in the, in the, in the first example, right? 
when the when the record was in the middle. Why I need to pay n over b cost? Can I just pay half n over b? Once I scan all the way here, I can stop. Well, you cannot stop. Even if all the records so far are values less than the letter square with c, because you don't know this in the sorted file. You don't know that for a fact. Even if so far they are sorted, it guarantees nothing about the remaining record, whether they are sorted or not. You still have to go all the way end to be sure that you're not missing any record. That makes sense? So I may have a, for example, I may have a set that says 1, 2, 4, 6, 9, 10, and some remaining values. You go this far, can you claim they are sorted? Or you cannot. Maybe they are sorted until, in the extreme case, they are sorted until the very last one. It may happen, right? You, you cannot stop in the middle unless you know for sure that somebody else tells you, oh, this is a sorted file. This is not a key file. That's why the key file scan in general is always unworthy if you use key file scan to do a range burst. Even if you observe so far they are sorted. But to be sure, you have to go all the way there. Okay. So the cost is really uh, like this, the comparison of the two. So this simple example, I gotta, you know, the reason I mentioned this simple example is to show you that selectivity is really an important factor in determining you know, how you're going to execute a particular program. It's not a simple decision as, you know, if this is the case, always do this. If that's the case, always do that. It really depends on your selectivity. This immediately brings up another question, which is, okay, fine, point is taken, selectivity is important, right? But how do I know my selectivity? How do I know there is 10% students that see us in my uh, university population? You might argue, okay, that's easy, right? Find all the CS students, divide by the total number of student population, you got your selectivity. But that defeats the purpose of finding out selectivity, right? If, you, if that's the way you find out your selectivity, you have executed your query in the first place. Your whole point of using selectivity is to optimize your query execution. But you, your answer to me is, oh, in order to do query optimization using selectivity, you need to execute the query first. Somehow. That defeats the whole purpose, right? It's like, Tell me which road, let's say there are two routes to Boston from Salt Lake City. One is go to I-98 from Chicago, the other is go I-78 from Colorado, and then somehow back to Boston. Tell me which road is closer. And you said, wait a minute, then you come back 10 days. So it took me six days to drive on the I-90 route, and take me four days on the I-78 route. You should go I-78. <laughs> Does that make sense? I mean, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense, right? So it doesn't make sense. So you have to somehow estimate that without executing the query itself. So how do we do that? So that's a challenge, right? That's the challenge we're gonna answer in the next, uh, in, the, in, the, in, in this particular lecture. So this particular slide covers these two cases, right? When you have no index, it boils down to whether it's sorted or not, if it's not sorted at all, then you have no choice, but you have to do a key file scan. But if it, it is sorted, then you have to look at your selectivity to make it easier, whether you do a sorted file scan or a key file scan, by looking at your selectivity. Somehow, there's a way to, uh, to estimate selectivity. For the moment, you, you guys can view that selectivity estimation as a black box, and we'll come back and read it out, and talk about how to build that black box. For now, I'll just imagine there is a black box somehow magically tell you, <coughs> given the input query, what's the selectivity of this? For example, what's the number of uh, percentage of CS students in University of Utah? I can tell you some, that number uh, just magically without looking at uh, the entire student population. Okay? Now, what happens if you do have an index? What happens if you do have an index? Well, that depends on 
What kind of index you have? Generally speaking, we have two types of index structures. One is a tree index structure, and one is a hash index structure. <coughs> right? Hash or tree. And for the tree index structure, we further have cluster index versus uncluster index. Right? You have seen this from both your midterm tests as well as your homework too. The difference is huge, right? For cluster index, for me to do rich search, I can come down here and do linear scan here. For our cluster index to do range search, I have to come down here, follow the boundary, come back here, and, do back and go back and forth like that. Because that's the only way to ensure that I'm looking for all the records in a particular order. The record, they are representative, the, the data entries in the leaf level are sorted, but the records themselves in the data file are not sorted. So I have to go back and forth. So that incurs a lot of IOs. So the difference of the two is kind of huge. Right? So, in order to determine whether a particular selection query can be speed up using an index or not, we need to define a few terminologies. So let's look at, first of all, a, a, a condition like this. The first thing is we convert any selection condition into conjunctive normal form. So how many of you heard heard of this terminology before, conjunctive normal form, CNF. There is also something called a DNF, right? destructive normal form. So, so what, what are the differences of the two? What's CNF, what's DNF? CNF says for any logical operations, which is a combination of N or all or not, right? you can always rewrite them, rearrange them, such that it's, it's in the following form. So any logical term T, no matter how complex it is, can be expressed as as a limited number of terms all together, where NATI contains only N. You follow me? And there is a similar effect saying that you can also express this as Of course, a different set of T, right? That's N together. Where each term only has all in it. You follow me? And this is called destructive number form. Because this, they're destruct. They're all together. And this is called conjunctive number form. Because they're N together. This is CNF, this is DNF. Do you follow me? Follow this argument? So any logical operation, no matter how complex it is, is if it's only involved N or all, and in the general form, uh, not operator as well, you can rewrite that, rearrange the term to get either a conjunctive normal form or destructive normal form expression of that. Okay? So that's, that will be the first thing we do. We're going to rearrange the query condition, the wire clause, into conjunctive normal form or destructive normal form. And then from that, we will do a matching of index with regard to that CNF or DNF. Uh, I don't have time for that today. I will continue that discussion on Thursday. Uh, 